we're out of Fells Point, and you've talked to me before about a, I don't know if he's necessarily famous worldwide, but famous to Fells Point magician named Dantini. Dantini, what can I say? <laughs> he knew Houdini. <laughs> he knew Houdini? He, he, that was, his, that was his saying, Dantini, oh. <laughs> he knew Houdini. <laughs> Whether or not he did, that's... Oh, he actually knew oh, him. Oh, he did actually oh, know yeah, him? Yeah, he did That's know really him. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so could you tell us a little bit about Dantini and why he is so fondly remembered? Oh, yeah. Well, he was at, for many years, it could have been, I don't have my notes in front of me, but, it, you know, 15 years or so, maybe longer, he performed... Um, at a place called the Peabody uh, Bookstore and Beer Stube. I think it was in the 800 block of, uh, of North Charles Street. Okay. okay. Yeah, so he was there. And he just became uh, this, this character. Well, he was a character. He, he grew a long white beard. He looked a little bit like Noah or whatever <laughs> it is. And uh, he wore thrift shop clothing. The Peabody Bookstore was in, divided into two sections. So um, you go down just a couple steps, and then you walked in, and there was a bookstore there. Uh, it had a musty smell to it when you walked through it. But what would happen, you would keep walking, and then there was this giant room. I mean, it was huge. And it, had, uh, it was all knotty pine, from what I remember. They had a giant fireplace there, this big moose head. I mean, I've never seen a moose head this big before hanging on the wall. And they had, uh, you know, I don't know how many tables, you know, 10, 15 tables covered in red and white checkerboard cloth, you know. But they also had a, a, a place upstairs. And uh, so Dantini would do, I think it was two shows on the ground level a night, and then he would go upstairs okay. and do, do shows again. So uh, we do four shows a day is what he did. Wow. But he was an excellent, and I mean excellent, sleight of hand artist. In the magic trade, there is a course called the Chavez course of sleight of hand. Okay. It means nothing to the general public. <laughs> but Dantini was as good as any graduate from that course. Wow. Yeah, that's how good he was. Now, I saw his act numerous times. I think I discovered the Peabody shop sometime around 1972, 73, somewhere around there. I was right out of high school, and I, I think it was a friend of mine from, uh, from high school said, because uh, we stayed in contact and we were going to college. He said, you got to go to this place. you got to see this magician. And I went there, and I was hooked from day one. For first off, you would go in, it was kind of dimly lit, and they had a piano over there, and, and they would just have singers, somebody would play the piano, and, and you would sit, you would have a drink and a piece of pizza, or whatever it was, and then uh, Dantini would come on, and then he would come on, uh, you know, everything stopped, and they put like a little spotlight, you know, like a little bulb or something, yeah. to turn it on, and he, he would come out, and then, uh, I'll never forget, he, he would come out, and and he was very uh, soft-spoken, and he would wear like a little, it looked like a little turban of s some sort, and he had that long beard, and uh, he'd probably be wearing uh, jeans or dark-colored pants and a, a coat and sometimes a plaid shirt, you know. Not what you would think a magician, but, right. that, but that was him. And uh, he would come out and say, and now, ladies and gentlemen, he talked with a, he was Polish, so he had a little accent you couldn't tell what it was but it was he say and now ladies and gentlemen we're going to have a short intermission at which time i will entertain you with a few magic twicks he always said <laughs> instead of saying tricks he said twicks i don't know i just thought that was funny but he would come out and he would light a cigarette and he didn't really smoke but he would, he needed it for his act so he'd come out and he would light this cigarette and it just it would light it and then put it back in his mouth, and then he, he would reach into his coat pocket, and he would bring out a handkerchief, show it both sides, go like this, and then he would take the cigarette and just drop the lit part of it into the, the handkerchief. And he'd go like this here, go like this, and we'd just go like this, wave his finger, and then he would remove it, and the cigarette was gone. How? That's how he started, you know. It wasn't stage illusions, but, right. but I tell you, the people say, well, how the heck did he do that, you know? His act only was lasted about 15 minutes. 
but he, he would come out with his uh, you know, with playing cards, and he would he would have his cards. And first, he would take a uh, he, um, he would take a deck of cards and hold it like this here, and he could with one hand he could shuffle that deck of cards. It was called a one-handed shuffle. Okay. And I could do it, but I can't do it as good as he could do it. And he would do that. And then he's saying was, it took me three years to do it, six months to learn it, and two and a half years to find a place to show it. <laughs> and here I am at the Peabody bookstore after all that struggle. <laughs> so he had these little lines, people that had seen the show so many times, like all my friends. I mean, we could almost mime the words that he was saying to that. And we were just, they were kind of like, I don't know, it was just funny stuff. I, we thought it was funny. And then he would do, then he would take the cards and uh, he would say, uh, uh, I forget what he would say, but he would take the cards and he would drop them and he goes, this is the, the waterfall shuffle. He would do that. And then he would take the, uh, the uh, cards and he would put, he would do a, what they call it a ribbon spread, or take the cards and put them on his arm like this here. And then he would take his hand and go like this, and the cards would flip over this way, and then they would flip over that way. And then he would toss the cards up into the air like this and catch the whole deck wow. like that, you know. And then he would take the cards, and then he would start tossing them up in the air, and they would start vanishing like this here. And he would show the front and back of his, you know, his hand, and you couldn't see the cards, right? And he kept doing that, doing that. And then he started producing cards, producing cards. Then he would produce a fan of cards. Wow. And then another fan. And he would toss them into this little container and produce another fan of cards, another fan. And that's, how, that's what he would do, you know? Then he had a, a ball. He'd, call, he'd say, watch the little golf ball. And he would take this little ball and go like this, and he would palm it, you know, but you couldn't see it, and he would make it disappear. Then he would bring the ball back, and he would put it in his mouth, like here, and he would go as if he swallowed it. <laughs> and then he would, you know, like he shoved it in his mouth, and then, then he would go like he had it here, and he would push here and push here, and then he would hold his nose like this, and it would drop out. And he would do that. <laughs> he also did, they called it the miser's dream where he would have these coins. So this is uh, one of Dantini's tokens. And uh, he, some magicians would use, when they would do the miser's dream, they would use a, a 50 cent piece. Okay. Or they would use a, what they call them palming coins. They're coins that are about the size of a uh, 50 cent piece, but they're a little bit thinner. Okay. But Dantini would just use his own little tokens. <laughs> And he would take the coins, and I'm not a sleight of hand artist, but he would take the coins, toss them up in the air, and they would vanish. He would do that. Then he would proceed to catch them. He would catch them out of thin air. Doop, boop, boop. And he always caught more than what he made vanish. You know? <laughs> so he would, he would do that. He had one effect in his show. He had one audience participation effect. And he would always, he told this story, and I hope I get the story right. He said, uh, in 1926, I went to New York, and I went to a magic shop, and there was a magician um, putting some stuff away, and I watched him for three or four minutes, something like that. He always said that, <laughs> something like that. And he goes, when he turned around, I said, are you the man in the movies? <laughs> and he said, yes, I am the man. And that was Harry Houdini. Wow. And he died in 1920. He died a few months later. That's what he said. And he says, but, and then he said that in his show, he did an effect similar to this. And he brought out a, uh, like an amber colored, uh, it looked like a scarf of some sort. And he would get a young lady up to help him. And he would take the scarf and wrap it around her neck. All right. And then he would say, uh, he had some lines. I'm probably going to get them all messed up. But he would say, uh, I presented this trick on Broadway and Golf Street. A reference <laughs> to Fells Point. <laughs> he thought, oh, Broadway, New York. No, on Broadway and Golf Street. And then he would say, uh, I practiced this trick 10 times last night on a broom. <laughs> it only worked once. Oh. And he said, have you ever heard of the, uh, the Boston Strangler? I am the Fells Point Strangler. 
Then he would say, now get ready. And he would, he would act like he was going to pull it. He goes, uh-oh, something went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, then he would pull it right through her neck. He would wow. Do that, yeah. And then he always closed with, uh, they called it the Chinese linking rings. And they were silver uh, uh, rings of steel, chrome, whatever. And he had eight of those. And he would take them and link them. You know, show them separate and then take them and start linking them. Blah, 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 blah. So he had a whole ring of eight is what he would do. And then that, that basically concluded his act. But then he would always say, he says, uh, and now, I'm trying to talk like him. And now um, I'm going to bring my little, you would think he was going to say um, frying pan, but he called it, a, it sounded like he's saying crying pan. <laughs> I'm going to take my little crying pan around and you could give me whatever you would like. And that's, he would work for tips. Okay. That's basically what he did, you know. And I don't think he ever got paid there, but, um, he, you know, he would get, you know, free drinks, probably free food, and he would do it again, twice a night there, twice a night upstairs. I think it was at um, uh, 10 o'clock was the earlier show. That was the one I always went to. Okay. And then I don't know what time the other one started. I'd have to look it up. But, but that was his act. That's, that's what he did, yeah. Now, how long did he perform in Fells Point? Or at least the Baltimore area, I should say. Oh well, see, he moved around a lot. He he had a wide a wide career. Okay. I mean, uh, his whole living was from magic. I could tell you that, and that's, and uh, I'm not saying he made a great living performing magic, but he made a li that's he was a pure magic junkie. He really was, and uh, you know he. Uh, you know, he went to New York. He was a, a professional amateur on shows. He would do that. You know, he starred in, uh, what was it, 1946. Uh, he was in, uh, um, what was it, the show called Around the World. It's not Around in the World in 80 Days. It was just called Around the World, and that was with Orson Welles. So it he was, was in a movie? No, it was a, a stage show. A stage show, yeah. okay. And... His job was to, he, he was in the audience, and he was basically a stooge. He had a duck under his coat. <laughs> so at some point during the show, uh, Orson Welles, the legendary Orson Welles, came by and produced a duck from out of his, out of his coat. That was Dantini's big bet, you know. <laughs> and he used that in his advertising. Dantini appeared on Broadway and. The, the original production of Around the World in 80 Days with Orson Welles. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so. But he did other things. I mean, um, uh, he worked for a magic company. Um, but, he, you know, he, he experimented in stage illusions, but that just really wasn't his thing. And, uh, and uh, now he had a brother. His brother's name was Julian. Dantini's real name was Vincent Serkis. That okay. was his name. And he had a brother named Julian, and his brother liked magic too. Now his brother was a, a writer for the Baltimore Guide, and I don't know why, but he went under a different name, <laughs> his pen name, I guess. But he went under, under the name of Bob Denning. Okay. And I knew his brother too. I knew his brother pretty well, and his brother was uh, Bob. It was always. Um, uh, loved magic, and whenever he could, he would plug it in the East Baltimore Guide. So if he knew something was going on and there was a magician, he made sure it got a story. That was pretty nice of him. Yeah. 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 But I got together with his brother. We had dinner a couple times. And I actually went to his house. He lived right off of Route 40, and I was there a couple times. You know, he gave me a lot of stuff. He gave me a lot of, that's how I got these Dantini tokens he gave out to me. It actually gave me, or I bought, I can't recall now, I, I gave him some money, but um, he gave me a whole collection of Dantini photos. I have all that. And uh, I'll never forget, after I got that, he told me to come back in a couple weeks. And it was like, so I had just seen him, and I think it was like a week later, it was on a Monday, I picked up the newspaper. And there it was, he died. Uh, and I was like, what? I can't believe that, you know. But, mm -hmm. uh, now, with Dantini, I, uh, 
I came into contact with him numerous times. It was through fate. I saw him at, uh, in Fells Point once. I didn't know who he was, but he was just, I never forgot that long beard. Sometimes, he, you know, you'd have a he's top hat on or whatever it was, but that long beard, once you saw it, you never forgot it, you know. And then he came to uh, my friend's costume shop, A.T. Jones. I saw him there. But there was a place, I think it's on South Wolf Street. Um, it was called uh, uh, Mar Hankey's. Mar Hankey was an agent, and he dealt in movies. Okay. And uh, he had a shop there and uh, it sold movie memorabilia. And in the early 70s, as I got into collect, you know, back into magic, I had this fascination with movie posters. And I collected movie posters okay. and uh, film trailers and lobby cards. And that shop sold this stuff. So I went there, and while I was there, who was there but Dantini? And Dantini used to hang there. Okay. And I guess because... Um, at one time, uh, Dantini actually did shows, performed sh some ghost shows with McCarl Roberts and the two of them. And, that's, and he, Dantini, knew more Hanky, and he would hang there. So I would go talk with him. Now, I remember once talking with Dantini, and I actually, he lived, um, it could have been, I don't know, was it 500, 600, 700 block of South Wolf Street, I think. And I actually went to his house once, but I was only there one time. And it's, you know, you're trying to remember back, you know, like 40 some years ago. That's really hard to do. Yeah. But it's, I remember seeing some magic props and magic books. But, uh, you know, I, that, that was about all I can remember from it, you know. Now, obviously, Dantini's no longer with us, but what, towards the end of his life, uh, when was he still performing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was performing up until. The, the minute he died. Really? Yeah. He died in 1979. And so what happened was he was, he was at the Peabody bookstore. And something happened. I guess one of the other entertainers was, was on and said that uh, his act was delayed a little bit. And he said to somebody, he says, I must go on, I must go on. And while he was sitting at the table waiting to go on, he just fell over and that wow. was sad. yeah and it was sad but i would tell you this is that uh as it's been told to me and, and i have some of the documentation myself is that you know for weeks after that well actually the news american which no longer exists uh and that was one of the two daily newspapers it made the top it made the headlines. Wow. Dantini died. I mean, it wasn't the top, but I mean, it was on the top. So for the next a couple of weeks, there were all these articles and stories about Dantini, the magician, editorial columns. Wow. And I remember, I forget the name of the funeral home. Uh, it's on uh, Eastern Avenue. But uh, I, I remember I was in college I was in college and had files. I would have gone to Dantini's funeral, but I, co I couldn't because I had files. To do, you know, how do you get out of that? Mm -hmm. But I, I do remember taking my magic wand to the funeral home, and I saw Bob Denning there, his brother, and I gave him my wand, and I said, uh, look, I said, I would appreciate it if, if you would, they, they have a, um, in the magic world, they have a thing called the, uh, uh, the broken wand ceremony, okay. where it's basically you give a little speech and then you take a magician's wand and you break it, which basically said the magic is ended. Wow. You know? So, and he told me he was going to do that. Now, whether he did it or not, I, I don't know, but that's, that's, that was about it. But you always think that that was the end of the story. But what happened was, is that, uh, you know, again, these articles appeared for weeks and weeks. And um, I know that uh, Schaefer came to the funeral and there was a lot of city officials came. They all knew him, you know, and it was kind of touching that that happened. Here was this local magician who never made it big time, but he was such a character. And that's uh, it's something that you know, makes you feel good, you know, when you hear that stuff. But I remember it was like a couple years later, 
I was driving on Howard Street. I thought I was going to have an accident when I saw it on this giant billboard that says Dantini. <laughs> and I was like, what? And I took a picture of it. And it was, uh, the city had this competition. Uh, and they, the, the winners, their artwork was going to appear on, on these billboards. And it was something about Dantini. I said, he just has a way. I keep coming, coming. back, you know. And that's what I was saying. It was, it was great, you know. And it's, uh, it, you know, it's like when these characters sort of disappear, you feel like, I don't know, it, 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 this, you lose something. Right. It just, you lose something, you just cannot get it back. And, and that's sad. And, you know, it's, it's part of nature, I guess, but it's. I'm not saying I like it, but I'm right. just saying that's what, what happens, you know. Dantini was in several movies. One was called, uh, what was it, The Great v v Variety? That was the one. That was one of his better films. That was the one where you actually see him do his sleight of hand act. And actually, it's a very artistic movie. I think it was done by a guy named Chris Buchanan or something like that. But it was a wonderful film, and uh, it, it kind of pulls on your heartstrings when you watch it. Very artistic. It wasn't very long. It was about 15 minutes long. <laughs> so, as long as Dantini's act. <laughs> but uh, he made these other films, and some of them were, were not very good. So he made this one film called uh, Our Baltimore. It took years to make the film. And Dantini had about 20 different filmmakers work on there and he would fire them for various <laughs> reasons but he put this film together our baltimore so they were going to show it at the civic center wow now you, the arena yeah. whatever it's called these things now you know that place is huge yeah you know the beatles played there <laughs> shows you how big it's the biggest at the time it was the biggest auditorium that, that existed in this city so he rented that wow and I know it was a, a few thousand dollars. Now, I don't think Dantini had it to begin with. <laughs> but he had it, and uh, they, sh they had the world premiere at the Civic Center. And I remember there was a big to-do in the Sun Paper and the, or the News American, big pictures, this world premiere. And I, I know uh, Schaefer was there. Uh, Blaze Starr could have shown up because he did know her. She, she was there, some of the other city officials. But only about 60 people showed oh. up. Yeah. So here you have this auditorium that seats maybe 10, 15,000 people. And you only have 60 people <laughs> there watching. And the way I heard it, it was an absolutely terrible film. Oh. It was a, a, a mixed match of everything. And uh, I think it even had a horse race in it. And it, it's, it had nothing to do with the film. But they needed to pad it out to make the film longer. Oh. But I mean, it was a disaster. And afterwards, I think McCarl Roberts was talking to Dantini, and he said, Dan, he said, uh, Dan, he goes, uh, about this f film, he goes, you know, you, you lost everything doing this. And Dantini said, well, at least it was good publicity. <laughs> and that was, that was Dantini. You know, he tried to look at the bright side of life. You know, he would, he would find that in it, you know. And that was another time that's how I came in. And I think that's how I heard about Dantini, too. Because I remember I was home, and my father said, Mark, Mark, come here. you got to see this guy. you got to see this. So I ran down the steps. I had no idea why I was running down the steps. And it was Dantini and that, that film. And I thought, my father said, this is great. And I said, this is, it's a great film, Dad. And that's how I heard about huh. Dantini even then, you know. You don't know how you begin to learn about somebody, but that was probably the, the one time that I went to the fun festival, then I saw him down George's costume shop, and then more, you know, and I can't say that I knew him really well, uh, but I, every time I would see him perform, now I was in college, but I'd give him a $5 tip. It was my way of saying thank you. Thank you. you know, thanks for what you're doing, you know. Now I did go to interview him, and I took a tape recorder with me, and this was probably just a few months before he died, and I was going to interview him. And uh, I took the, the tape recorder to the Peabody bookstore, plugged it in, and for some reason it, it jammed up or Ooh. it just wasn't working. But you got to remember technology. Our stuff just, you know, even our cameras were the quality of the films of these little cameras they had back in the 
late 60s and seven, early 70s. They just aren't anything, you can't compare it to what's out there today. And I was so disappointed. I said, oh, darn it, why did this thing fail? And, uh, and a couple months later, a couple weeks later, he died. And it's just, that's what happens, you know. But I tried. You tried. <laughs> <laughs> Dantini uh, grew up on Thames Street. I'm not exactly sure where, but he grew up on Thames Street. And uh, his house had long been torn down. Um, he had an interest in magic. I, th I think the way I heard it is that, that he had heard stories that people would tell these stories of these magicians, and that kind of piqued his interest. But he actually, from what I understand, there was a he saw a magician, uh, and he may have performed at the Broadway theater, and that kind of got his interest. And then, um, but his parents did not like magic, or his mom didn't, and she thought it was the work of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and people thought, you know, she, and she, you know, she came right from from Poland, and that's how she thought. But that didn't stop him. He went out on his own and did magic. Now, I had heard that uh, years later that when she died, they went to her house. They knew that there was money there, but they didn't know where it was located. So the house was very cold, and they had an old-fashioned stove, okay. and they lit the stove. And when they lit the stove, they found out where the money was. Was it in the stove? He was in the stove. Oh. Now, why somebody would put money in a stove, I do not know. But whatever money they were going to get just went up in flames. That's a sad story, oh. but that's true. Maybe but that kind of sums up Dantini's life, you know. Yeah, overwhelmingly tragic and overwhelmingly human. <laughs> that's how it's been, he's been described, you know. Uh, but like I said, you know, the Peabody Bookstore, I probably went there... Um, I wouldn't say once a month. Or it could have been. I mean, when I first went there, I went there just about every month. And, uh, but, you know, it's every six weeks, seven weeks. I did that for years. Wow. A lot of times if I had dates, I would take them there because I thought, oh, it's just fun. You know, and it was uh, great entertainment. And they, they used to have the drinks. They had, uh, so let's see what they had. Um, during the winter, they had hot buttered rum drinks. Oh, I <laughs> love that. Actually, they put little dabs of butter. I thought that was cool. They had that. And then the, uh, the springtime, they would have uh, Pim's Cup, which is a British drink. It had a little slice of cucumber in there. <laughs> you know? That was great. But uh, a lot of times, it was just college-age kids there, um, uh, professors, the people there that would go there and just hang there. And it was, uh, and again, they have a big fire going during the winter. So you're outside and again, come in and had a hot buttered rum and sit by the fire. It was very cozy. And then Dan Tini, and it's, his act was sort of like uh, from another period in time. Hmm. You're watching this. And, and like I said, but a lot of the college kids, they just thought he was great. And, uh, you know, some were sitting behind him. So while he's, you know, Make it cool, and they could see the stuff. But you know, depending on the angle, yeah. you know. But I mean, well, for you were facing him, you couldn't see a darn thing. You know, he was he, again. He was quite talented. You know, but uh, and again, he did ghost shows. He did midnight ghost shows. Now he was at the the Broadway Theater. You know, he did go, midnight ghost shows with McCarl Roberts for years, and it was at the Broadway Theater that somebody had a bomb, some sort of. I don't know, it was a pipe bomb or something, but it went off during the blackout when the ghosts were appearing. And there was a lot of screaming, and, and when lights came up, and smoke and everything, and they blew up a seat wow. in the theater, and a piece of metal, shrapnel, shrapnel, went flying and cut a girl's leg. They had to take her to the hospital. But it wasn't their fault. I mean, it's just some goofball did that. Right. And it was at that point, that's when... I know that's when McCarl Roberts said, that's it, I'm done with the ghost show era. And it was really coming toward the end of it anyway. It, w it would have died out yeah. regardless. But, you know, you know, everything has a cycle, you know, and that's what happened. Yeah, and there was another time, like, see, he got this, Dantini was discovered by, this was in the 70s. Uh, uh, s Dantini died in 79, so somewhere around 73, 74, 75. He got discovered by all the artists in, in, uh, 
uh, the uh, Maryland Institute, and he was a model for them. He, I think he got paid five dollars an hour to do sittings. Huh. And people, I remember, I'd be walking around and I'd say, "Look, here's a picture of Dantini." You know, huh. and it's, so you, they would they would do paintings of him. And uh, there was a Fells Point Art Gallery. I think it was on Broadway, and but they had a whole exhibit on Dantini. Wow! And that was advertised in the in the either the News American or the Sun paper. Come to this exhibit where. <laughs> Dantini. <laughs> so it was like, you know, it, it was just interesting stuff. So when he died, some friends of his at one of the bars, there, there's a little plaque. It's in the little park area right outside of Bertha. So if you look okay. down on the ground, you'll see it. I remember ta talking to some folks. I know they're going to redo the square, but I've already said, look, you know, that was there. It's been there for years. And I said, you know, I'm willing to take money out of my own pocket to get a new one done. Because this one, it wasn't really a, uh, a proper plaque. It's, right. it's starting it where it's all discarded, you can't see it. But I'd like to put a really nice plaque there, you know. And I was talked too that when he died, that they were going to name a park after him. They were going to call it Dantini Park. <laughs> Now, exactly where that was, I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure it was in Fells Point. Now, whether that's the, the one uh, located further down the street uh, on Thames Street, uh, I'm not sure, you know. But uh, I'll volunteer to push for that idea. <laughs> <laughs> the Antini Park, you know. So a lot of uh, magicians. So when we had our magic collectors group, I remember um, I, we were up in, uh, where were we? In Boston. That's what McCarl gave his talk about Dantini and absolutely killed wow. with that lecture. And people said that was the greatest lecture on magic they had ever heard. It was about Dantini. Huh. And throughout the convention, people were saying, Dantini, he knew Houdini. <laughs> and that went on for days. And it was so popular that at the time, Magic Magazine, um, it's, it's just ending now, it's been going on for 20, 25, uh, 25 years, they, uh, they wanted a, an article about Taney. So they, McCarl wrote up an article and they did that. And then, uh, and then there was, uh, when we hosted the Magic Collectors, we did another Dan Taney thing there. So all these people now, at least in the magic world, know who Dan Taney is. And again, he never made it big time, but he still made an impression with a lot of people, you know. And that's the, the neat part about it, you know. And uh, I guess that's why I like him so much, you know. So he's like an underdog. Yeah. An under. That's the only way I can describe. He doesn't it. like an underdog. Yeah. And you always, you're always rooting for the underdog. Yeah. And uh, and again, he never made it, but it's like he never gave up either. He's like a Rocky in a, in a <laughs> sense, you know. Now I do have here, if I can show you this, I have a uh, a brick. Don't ask me why, <laughs> but when I heard that the uh, the Peabody bookstore was going to be demolished, uh, I don't know what possessed me to do it, the magic collector in me. I actually went to the, uh, the pulled up right out front of the, the place and asked if they could, um, I'd like to take a couple bricks. So I picked up about six or seven bricks and... Um, and they, I gave them out to the, our members of the Society of Osiris. I only okay. have only have one left. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Here it is. So, and it's funny when we were doing this. I thought, ah, I, for, I forgot. I have actually a brick from the Peabody Bookstore. Now, you know, I probably should have looked through the rubble and picked like another one or whatever it is. Uh -huh. But you know, this was all done very quickly. Right. You know, they had the the wrecking ball there and I said, hey, hey, stop, stop, can I get a couple of bricks? <laughs> so that's what happened. So that's the only one that I have in that, you know, and and I guess I should uh, get a little thing on there just as I remember it. But anyway, that's that's the only one that I have left. But anyway, that's oh. actually this is the only Dantini poster I have left. Uh, I had a lot of them, but when I sold my Go Show collection, they. That was all part of it. I okay. sold that off. But I kept this one. Be, uh, where McCarl Roberts gave this to me. I can't remember. But it says the Broadway Theater. And I always thought that's where it was right where it all kind of started with Dantini, you know. And I thought, oh, I'm going to keep that one. So. Uh, and do you know what year this was from? 
Uh, probably, I mean, in, in the 50s, exactly okay. when, I don't know, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was kind of neat. So, uh, is McCarl's name listed there? I don't actually see it. I see Dantini. Um... Now, a lot of times McCarl, because he was with the uh, Maryland Bible Society, he did not want his name listed. Oh, okay. So it was, he did that on purpose. Yeah. That's what happened. But I know that he worked with the great Marco the Hypnotist. Did he tell you about him too? No. Oh, he did? No. <laughs> well, Marco was a hypnotist, and he wasn't necessarily a great one. <laughs> and he was cross-eyed. Huh. So when he would say, look me into the eye, he said, he would almost say, which eye? You know, because <laughs> of the way he looked, you know. But he was with the, the show. Now, Marco didn't have good sense at times and I remember it's in it's in my book but uh, they were playing a place I think it was uh, in Crisfield Maryland they were gonna do a midnight go show it was Dantini McCarl Roberts and Marco and it was a Quonset hunt hut I think that they were performing in and Marco arrived late and what he didn't realize that it was an all black um, theater. Okay. And it was all African Americans there. Nothing wrong with that. Was, that's the way it was. But he brought with him four stooges that were white. <laughs> so he's now going to try to seat these four white individuals in an all black audience so that when he asked for four assistants, <laughs> The four white gentlemen are going to come up, and nobody's going to know the difference. Oh. And I heard that it was a mess. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you can't make this stuff up, oh, you know, but that's what happened, you know. And I remember Ricardo, he probably told you this story, too, about saying, one time Dantini came to him and said, uh, Ricardo, he says, I have to talk to you. He goes, that the show that we're doing, it's its too scary. He said, when you're talking to the people and telling them that ghosts are going to appear, he says, you're getting them all worked up. They're getting too scared, too afraid. He goes, I wouldn't do that. He goes, they're coming to see a ghost show. <laughs> he says, he goes, that's why they're coming to see the show. And he goes, yeah, but that's too scary. He goes, I, I would tell you, you ought to cut that out of the show. But he didn't cut it out. Right. <laughs> And that's what he said. Sometimes that was the thinking of Dantini. You know what I mean? In my collection of Dantini stuff, Dantini often talked that he was going to write a book okay. all about Howard Thurston and Houdini. And there, I even have the advertisement for it, but I've never. He's never actually I don't, wrote. I don't <laughs> think that he actually wrote it, but he had the advertisement for it. But it got me. It piqued my interest when I saw that. I ah, you know, but. I just, I seriously doubt if he ever wrote it, you know, but. It seems like he, he has a lot of big claims to make oh, his name bigger. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and again, Dantini was, uh, you know, one time he had a lot of stage illusions. And, uh, you know, some of them were purchased by McCarl and, in, uh, and then purchased by my friend George Goebel. And that's what happens with magic. You, you start out going in one direction and you think this is the direction you're gonna go and then things happen and you get pulled in another direction. And then you find out how you really fit in. And I think that's what happened with Dantini. He wanted to do a stage act, you know, where big stage illusions, when he discovered he really didn't have the personality or, you know, to, uh, to pull that off. And they eventually got down to a 15-minute act. But he was excellent doing that act. Minutes. And that's why, you know, he became famous here in the city hmm. for that, you know. But, cool. Uh, yeah, but the Peabody, the Peabody was a great place. It really was. Actually, they weren't supposed to tear it down. And that was, um, I think, Kurt Schmoke was the mayor at that time. And they were going to do some, some stuff around there. But they destroyed the place. Oof. And I think the company that destroyed it wound up paying, you know, something ridiculous, you know, a $5,000 fine. But they wanted the building to come down. But, you know, it's, you know and it's, it should have never been torn down. Right. You know, but that's, that's what happened to it. So 